I want to welcome the entire Grove family and our Grove family all across the world. Welcome. We pray that you leave today challenged and changed because of the power of the Word of God. From the moment you step in to the moment you leave, it is a house of prayer and praise and preaching. To show them His love, tell them His truth, teach them His ways. Good morning, Grove family. It's great to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Let's worship our God because He is faithful and trustworthy. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, and your way is the only way for me. It's a narrow road that leads to life, but I want to be on it. It's a narrow road, but the mercy's wide, because you're good on your promise. Take you at your word. If you said it, I'll believe it. I've seen how good he works. If you started, you'll complete it. I'll take you at your word. You spoke in the cave. Fell in line. I know because I've seen it in my life. It's a narrow road that leads to life, but I want to be on it. Yeah, it's a narrow road in the tide.
Thank you for this time. Lord, thank you for this commitment that this church family has made to pray for 90 days, just making sure that we're coming to you, Lord. And Father, it's so cool to know that we can just walk right up to you and we can just talk to you. We can talk to you like a friend, like a father, like the wonderful counselor that you are. But the most reassuring thing is that we can speak to the Almighty, not just one who gives wisdom and, and good advice and guidance, but God, you have your hand over all of this. Lord, you hold me in your hand. You hold every person in this room in your hand. And Father, we just thank you that we can approach you boldly. Lord, you are the Holy One, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the overcomer, the Savior, the victor. Perfect, mighty Father. Lord, let us all just rest today knowing that you care about even the little things in our life that if we were to tell even one another, maybe 
people would say, oh, don't worry about that. It's insignificant. You, you actually want, that's the level of intimacy you want with us. You want even the little things in our lives, let alone the big things that only you can work out. So, Father, let us all just come to you in faith this morning. Lord, draw us to yourself. Draw every person in this room and watching online and on TV. Draw them to yourself, Lord. Draw them with a broken and contrite heart because you will not turn that away. Let your will be done today, Father. In Christ's name, amen. And all God's people said, let's praise him this morning. He is worthy, worthy, worthy of our praise. Going to the Lord in prayer is a wonderful benefit and blessing that a believer has, as we've just prayed, but also is a necessity for those that want to commune and grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a privilege to do so. Today, we continue our collection of messages under the category going to the shed, going alone, being with God, whether it's your shed or your quiet place or you're in your car. We've encouraged, we're on day 36, we've encouraged our members and all believers to take 90 days to commune with the Lord, confess our sin, to have everything be praiseworthy, give him praise, and then to submit to his will. And boy, has it done a wonderful thing. And we have looked at the Psalms and we have looked at other scriptures, but today... We're going to look at a really interesting perspective on prayer. We're going to jump around a lot, but if you have your phones, go ahead and pull up Matthew chapter 26. If you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 26, and we're going to look at the pattern of Jesus' prayer life while God was on earth. It's so interesting. We have a theme verse for this series, and it's a beautiful verse in Psalm 27, verse 8. Psalm 27, verse 8 says, My heart heard you calling and saying, Come talk to me. And my heart responded, I'm coming. I'm coming. We talked about how we get important phone calls in our lives, and, and even in a meeting, there are some people, loved ones, your family, your children, where if a call comes in, you're like, guys, I, I'm sorry, I got to take this call, and you break whatever you're doing because it's such an important call. And we have committed that our time with the Lord is so important that when our hearts feel it, we will go to the shed, either physically or in our minds. We'll go to that quiet place. We've committed to do this prayer time before we walk into our homes and already testimonies of you of how your home and your conversations and the spirit has been positive. And I praise, praise the Lord for that. And how we before making big decisions, we need to get along with God. When the Lord says, call me, talk to me, you need to talk to me. This is kind of big. We always say, I must take that call. I must run when the Lord says, you know, before you move, come commune with me. It changes a demeanor. It changes a response. It changes an attitude. And I hope today we'll continue this theme by looking how important prayer was to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, um, if you theologically think about this, you have God come to earth. And I love that last song. That, I love when, as, as we prayerfully look at all the lyrics of the music to, to point us to the scripture and even at the end, I love how it just sang the truth of the word of God and now we're going to have it taught. But the, 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 the beauty of what he has done is that man was rebelled against God, even though he was his best creation. He rebelled against God. That disobedience introduced the taint of sin, the, 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 the tarnish of sin in our life. And, and our whole heart was, and life was tarnished. And, and it's, 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 it's a stain that we cannot erase ourselves. And man has known there's an instant distance and there's no longer peace with our creator Mankind throughout years have tried to do things to bring peace back with God because before sin was introduced, the beautiful creation of God, man had beautiful peace with the creator and then it caused a distance. So man has tried to regain that peace. 
Uh, they try to do by cleaning up their act. They go into a church house, do charitable things, outweigh maybe what they define as good versus bad. And it gets to the point where they hope that come judgment day, um, they'll be given grace and they want a better than comparison. I'm not as bad as these people. Uh, unfortunately, judgment day has already come on humankind. We talked about that a few months ago. J- judgment day has already come when... When man, woman, boy, or girl were born, we had this tarnish of sin, and we were distant from a peaceful relationship with God. So we need to get that fixed. And humankind has tried. And unfortunately, the scriptures say that you must have a, there's a penalty for that sin. You must absorb the wrath of God because God cannot commune with sin. Therefore, you must absorb the wrath of God, and no human being can absorb the wrath of God. Humanly, it's just not possible. You need a perfect human being in order to save mankind's sins, but there's none righteous, no, not one. There's no human being that's perfect. Uh, Only God is perfect. So we needed a God-man to come who was a perfect, sinless, no sin, human being, um, and only God can do that to absorb the wrath of the Father and to satisfy the payment for that sin that no human being could absorb. Uh, And that's exactly what that last song sang about, what he's done. God wrapped himself in flesh, came to this earth. We named him Jesus while he was here. He lived a perfect life, and he said, I'm going to go on the cross, and I'm going to absorb the wrath that you should absorb yourself. And to prove that I can save your soul and wash that tarnish away that you cannot wash away, I will take all of your penalty and die on the cross. And I'm going to then overcome sin and death by rising again three days later. We celebrate that every Sunday, specifically on Easter Sunday. And then he says, my sacrifice was sufficient to pay the sin penalty for you. But the moment he did it, it didn't save anybody. It simply made the payment of salvation available. And he extends his nail-scarred hands as the song just sung and says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. The scriptures describe that moment in various ways, beautiful ways, wash you whiter than snow, or cast your sins as far as the east is from west. Be- pick your metaphor, just beautiful of that moment, what he has done. And now, on this earth, you have immediate peace with your creator again. And the reason why we go to heaven after we pass from this earth is because we continue that peaceful relationship with our creator even after uh, we pass from this earth. Those that don't do that never have a peaceful relationship with God. And that's why, unfortunately, there's an eternity called hell where there is no peace. You only experience the wrath of God in hell. So that's the beauty of God come to earth. Now, when you talk about, and and by the way, I pray, I pray that every single person in the sound of my voice has heard as best as I could humanly attempt with the Spirit's help the message of the gospel. This morning, I was going through a business drive through and he said, what time's your service start? I said, 11. He goes, I'm going to send a couple people your way. Don't let them down. I guess a little dance, little pony show. I don't know. Well, not sharing the gospel would let them down, right? So I didn't let you down. It's a story and a hope that will change your life. And if you're here, by the way, Anthony says hello. And hopefully you've had a great experience. I hope you feel at home. That's a beautiful, beautiful story that we have embraced. So, when you talk about Jesus' prayer life, you have God having a conversation with himself. That's an interesting dynamic. The scriptures say that when God came to earth and we named him Jesus, he was fully God and fully man. So, in his humanness, the scriptures say he understood all of the struggles and all the temptations just like we are. We do not have a high priest, Hebrews 4, that says, is untouched by the feelings of our infirmities, but in all ways we're tempted like us. Therefore, we can boldly go to him to find grace and peace in the time of need, as Chad just prayed. So when we talk about Jesus' prayer, we, we can look at it from the mere mankind, human perspective, but I don't want you to miss the divine. You're going to see some of his prayers be very human, uh, 
he, he cries in the garden, Lord, if this could pass from me, please let it. He did not want to experience physical pain. There's no, no shame in that. He tells his disciples, my heart is exceedingly sorrowful unto death, meaning my heart's killing me. That's normal. But then, in front of Lazarus' tomb, he'll pray with his eyes. And that was the posture. You would lift your head up and um, raise your voice. Um, so I know we bow our heads. There's nothing wrong with that. But back then, they would open their eyes and lift up, look up to heaven. And he, he says, Lord, I don't pray for myself right now, but I pray for every, everyone around me that they will hear that they can trust you. God talking there. So it's really interesting, the prayer. But it's really interesting that the God-man in his humanity, in order to endure life on this earth, he kept a close, close, super unending bond with the Father. And the Spirit, you will see, minister to him as well. God, God on earth knew that he needed to regularly, constantly be breathing out communion prayers with the Father. And that's how he was able to come, overcome sin. It's really interesting. People say, could he have sinned or could he have not? And there's a theological question. Well, if you're God, you can't be tempted. But if you're humankind, there's theologians that say, well, his temptation was being being tempted to tap into his divinity to overcome his human temptation. That's probably right. So how did he overcome human temptations just like any other human does? Commune with the Father. You know, he didn't have a shed, but he had a mountainside, we're going to read, where he retreated a lot. In fact, Judas was able to find where he was the night to betray him because he says, quote, he constantly resorted there with his disciples to pray. He, He was able to find them to betray him because he knew his prayer schedule. Constantly got away in prayer. So the Lord on earth commune with the Father so that in its humanness he would overcome temptation just like you and I need to overcome it. Get in the mountainside, get in the shed, commune with the Father so that you will not be tempted. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. There's a passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that talks about this constant communion. 1 Thessalonians 5, I'll just read this and you'll see it. Verse 16, it says, always be joyful, never stop praying. Some translations, if you've grown up with the different translations, some says rejoice evermore and then pray without ceasing. Same thing. Always be joyful, which by the way, for all of you uh, Bible trivia people, verse 16 of 1 Thessalonians 5 is the shortest verse in the Greek New Testament. Jesus wept is the shortest verse in the English Bible, but in the Greek letters, uh, in verse 16, this only has 14 Greek words. Jesus wept in the Greek has 16. As if you care about that, by the way. Just... Let me have my fun here. But, so that's the shortest verse in the Bible, technically, Greek New Testament. Rejoice evermore. Always be joyful. Verse 17, though. Never stop praying. Pray without ceasing. Never stop praying. Always be in a continual, constant state of prayer. And Paul captures what Jesus exhibited. Constant communion with, prayer, with the Lord in prayer. That's how you overcome temptation. That's how you have a right perspective. That's how the Lord changes bad habits. That's how chains break. And when you get with the Lord and you say, you know, I have a fear and it falls and it crumbles and chains break. And that's how when you commune with the Lord, you're able to see spiritual victory. Never stop praying. We're going to see the Lord in constant prayerful communion. You're going to see him in scenes that are deeply um, emotional, and then you're going to see him pray in very tranquil, kind of unemotional times. He constantly prayed a lot all over the place. If you have your Bibles on Matthew chapter 26, verse 40, I'm going to take you to one of the most familiar statements about prayer. This is the end of his ministry right before he gets crucified. And I want to share with you some context about this passage. This passage is very familiar if you've been in church. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. His heart is hurting. He takes uh, Judas is out to betray him. Uh, Judas knows where they're at because he constantly resorted there to pray. Eight, John chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. And so he has 11 disciples. He takes, not, he takes uh, eight of the disciples, drops them off at the entrance of the garden. He takes three, Peter, James, and John, and starts talking personal comments with them. 
Like my heart is exceedingly sorrowful unto death, meaning my heart's killing me. He's sharing his, his, his thoughts with these closer disciples here as far as camaraderie and friendship. And then he goes and prays, and he asks them to watch and pray with them because it's a deep time. Now, he comes back a little frustrated. So here's where the story picks up. Matthew chapter 26, verse 40 and 41. Then Jesus returned to his disciples and found them asleep. Found them asleep. Now, this is really an interesting statement. We, we, we often say, Jesus is bothered by a couple things. Not just that he just poured out his heart, but he has also, secondly, shown them an example not to quit praying. Because if you pray during the tranquil times of your life, you will pray during the serious times of your life. Don't miss that. When you pray during the tranquil times of your life, your default reaction will be to steep in prayer during the serious times of our life. Um, for example, do you ever have those instances where a situation maybe at your job gets so serious and a deadline comes or a scenario is so serious where you, 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 you don't even think about the clock, you don't, you, you're just like, this has to be accomplished by this date. This cannot fall through the cracks. You forget about eating, you forget about dinner, you forget about uh, making your calls. You're like, you, just, you, you call your loved one, you go, hey, it's going to be late night because there's something with the level of gravity that just clicks something in you to say, it's not even a chore, a burden. I'm not even thinking about eating. I just, I just need to get this done because it's so serious. That's, that's what's happening here. And you will do that. You'll pick up and run with that if you are in a condition of always being prepped and ready. Same with prayer. The more you pray in your tranquil time, the more you'll know. Forget about everything. I don't care if you're tired. By the way, they are tired. They had a late night this night. They, they, they had Lord's Supper. The Lord has just dropped a lot of bombs, how he'll be betrayed, he'll be denied, and all this stuff. This is so serious, but they're falling asleep. But he's upset not just because he shared his heart, but that he shared his example when he was tired and didn't fall asleep and continued to pray, and he kind of felt disappointed. He said to Peter, could you not watch and pray with me for an hour? Keep watch and pray. The word watch, by the way, is gegoreo. It's a term that means to be vigilant, like stay at a high alert and endure. It's the same word as in 1 Peter 5, 8, where it says, be sober, be vigilant. The adversary of the devil runs around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. It's the word being watchful, be vigilant. This would be like on America and terrorist threat, being on high alert. Why couldn't you be on high alert with me? With me. This is the third time, by the way, in Matthew 26, he says, with me. Why, why couldn't you, like, hang with me here? Just for one hour. And he commands them again, keep watch vigilant and pray so that you will not get into temptation. The spirit is willing and the body is weak. By the way, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Psalm 121, verses 3 and 4. It says, the Lord neither sleeps nor slumbers. And I made a little joke, and I meant it. That if the Lord doesn't sleep or slumber and he's taking over, uh, he is over your life. Um, I remember a dear uh, uh, man that I just ignore, uh, admire, uh, Dr. Jerry Falwell Sr., he, he shared as I was a student, I remember I was sitting there, and he, he says, are people worried about you, uh, you know, in political and you getting attacked? And he goes, uh, in, that, in that voice that I just love, it's, you know, he says, the Lord, he could read his grocery list and sound holy, you know. A loaf of bread, you know, container bag. He said, uh, my Bible says that he neither sleeps nor slumbers. So why should there be two of us staying up all night? <laughs> Wonderful. So the Lord's up. They're asleep. Push pause here. Luke chapter 9, verse 28. They fell asleep at another huge situation where they could have been blessed. So this is um, maybe a year before this event. We call it the Mount of Transfiguration where the Lord showed his glory in a glimpse. It's the same parallel as to the Lord showing Moses the glory of God. It's a, it's a New Testament parallel where the Father showed the glory to Moses, just a glimpse, and his face showed like light. Uh, this is Jesus' turn to do that. So he's up on a mountain. It's a parallel to Exodus. After eight days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, the same group, the same group, 
about a year ago. As he was praying, his, the appearance of his face was transformed. Clothes be, uh, became, this is Luke chapter uh, 9, verse 29. His face was transformed. His clothes became dazzling white, just like Old Testament Exodus. Suddenly, two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared, began talking with Jesus. They were glorious to see. By the way, can you imagine Peter, James, and John seeing this scene? They didn't. You know why? Watch for it. Wait for it. They were glorious to see. They were speaking of, the, of his exodus from the world, which was fulfilled from Jerusalem. Verse 32, Peter and the others had fallen asleep. Luke 9, 32, quote, Peter and the others had fallen asleep and missed this wonderful worship opportunity to see the glory, what Moses saw a glimmer of, they fell asleep. We'll actually go over that passage in the summer. It's a pretty awesome passage. He found them asleep. Couldn't you watch and pray so that you don't give in to temptation? For the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. It's really interesting that in Matthew 26, earlier in this chapter, they had made a commitment. Lord, I will not betray you. I will not deny you. No matter what anyone does, I will not betray you. I will not deny you. Everyone's saying it. And Jesus said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. So they had made a claim to be spiritually strong. And then they fall asleep and they don't pray. They are tempted. He goes, watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. You made a claim. Now, are you going to do it? You have to do what is required of you not to fall into temptation. Pray. You just made a claim you're going to be spiritually strong. You're going to endure this situation. Okay? Pray. And they fell asleep. He goes, you need to watch and pray so you will not give in to temptation. And by the way, I think the Lord loves good intentions. But the first thing you ought to do when you make a spiritual resolution, the first thing you ought to do when you make a spiritual resolution is to say, okay, right now, before we even say another word, let's pray right now. Seal it in prayer. Go right to your knees and pray. And then how you will not give in to that temptation is to never stop praying. The spirit is willing. I love that word. The body is weak. The word willing, it's really interesting. Um, Pothuma, it's, it's, pothumos is a term that it means um, it's ready, it's eager, it's on standby, it's predisposed to, think of a big dog that in the dog's DNA, it's it's, it's trained attack. You have some canine, you know, units in our, uh, in our county security, and they are trained that, uh, it's funny, uh, we, we have some security folks, and he has this little floppy ear hound dog, and uh, cute as a button, he goes, but buddy, the moment I put that harness on, that dog is not to be petted, and it is not cute. And he was telling me all these stories of how, I mean, the dog even tracked a guy, walked right in, dog started running into the automatic doors of the Motel 8 and found, found the guy. It was just an amazing hound dog. He goes, this is a floppy ear little dog, but the moment I put that harness in, don't pet this dog. This is not a pet. The spirit is saying, the moment you harness me, the moment you call me up, I am predisposed, I'm, my dis- I, am, I am on the ready to attack the gates of hell for you. Um, it's a default reaction. Some of us drive in the car, and uh, we have a default reaction to keep whoever's in the passenger seat safe. I don't, know, I don't think I'm the only one that does this, but if sometimes the alarm goes up, and I have to hit my brakes, do you know what you do with your right hand? Yeah, yeah, you're all, yeah you're all just, I just saw all these hands go, yeah, it's like a boom. And I had my best friend in town. We were at a, uh, a meeting, and uh, he's my age, and, you know, He's my best. Good thing he was because uh, I hit my brakes and I immediately just grabbed him. And he just looks at me. His name's Bill. He's like, really? I'm like, it's it's what we're we're trained to do. It's in our DNA. The spirit is predisposed to go to war for you. The spirit is willing, just harness that and watch out. But the body, the flesh is weak. Zechariah 4, 6, I love this verse. Not by power, not by might, but by the spirit, says the Lord. Galatians 5, 6 says, walk in the spirit 
so you don't fulfill the desires of your flesh. Not by power, my power. Not by my might, not by my good intentions, but by the Spirit communing with the Lord, says the Lord. Walk in the Spirit so that you don't fulfill the desires of your flesh. If you want to have a God consciousness, what I call, where you think about God all the time, you will pray without ceasing. You will commune with the Lord. That's how you overcome temptation. It's really interesting that in the Gospel of Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, uh, this very night, Jesus turns to, this is Luke's account of the night, he turns to Peter, and he makes an interesting statement. He just says, I'm not going to deny you. And by the way, if you read scriptures, very care- we often give Peter a bad rap. He's the leader. That's why he gets all the attention. But it says, quote, and all the other disciples say they won't. So they were all in this game together. They were all saying, we won't deny you. The reason why Peter gets identified is he was a leader. There's no doubt. You speak to the leader, you affect the group. So here's what's interesting. Jesus turns to Peter at that moment about giving into temptation. In Luke twenty two thirty one, 31, he says this, Simon, Simon, Satan has just requested of me to allow him to sift you as wheat. Push pause. You've only heard this happen once before. Job chapter 1, Job chapter 2. Remember that account where the evil one says, let me touch him and he'll shame you. Well, let me touch it. Well, you can't kill him, but you can touch his life. You can touch his possessions. And and you saw this exchange of he will mock you. He will mock you. You saw that in Job chapter 1, Job chapter 2. This is a New Testament parallel. This is the second recorded instance where you have Satan, the Lord acknowledging that Satan has just made a request. Let me touch him. The word sift is the only time it's used in the New Testament right here. And it's just like you would mean, like wheat and chaff get kind of crumbled. And what they would do is that they would have a basket that was a little porous. And so they want the, the wheat to stay and all the leaves to, they would either throw it in the air or they would shake very violently. He wants to, he wants to tear you apart. He says, verse chapter Luke twenty two thirty two. 32, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail And when you repent, that's interesting, convert, you will be able to strengthen the brethren. You're like, wait, wait. He ended up denying. Was Jesus' prayer wrong, right? What happened there? Here's what's interesting. Watch this. Let me go back to the first verse. Here's the ancient languages. Luke 22, 31. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you to sift you as wheat. The yous there are all plural. He is asked to sift all of you, my whole discipleship group, all of the followers. He has asked to literally, violently break you apart, every single one of you. And then he turns to Peter in the next verse and turns the use to singular and in essence says, and you've got to make your own choice. In John chapter 11, right before he raised Lazarus from the dead, he said, did I not tell you, singular, that if you believe singular, that you, singular, would see the glory of God? No matter what people are denying my power at this tomb side, you must honor me. You must make your own choice. And he says, after you repent, after you converted, you'll strengthen the brethren. I prayed you wouldn't fail, ultimately, The the divine sovereign one knew that he would deny him and he would repent. And from the moment the Lord restored him, Peter died for his faith. That prayer came true. But it came down to a choice. Never forget this in prayer. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Never forget this in prayer. This is so very, very, very important. In prayer, there is a divine role and a human responsibility divine role in human responsibility. Philippians 2.12, dear friends, as you've always, I've, I've always instructed you, and now in my absence, this is more important, this advice. Work out, develop to show the results of your salvation. Work hard, obey God with deep reverence and fear. In the next verse, God. It's God that's working in you to give you this desire and the power that pleases him. So you pray 
as if it totally depends on God, and you obey as if it totally depends on you. That's the link. You pray and commune, and then you walk out controlled by the Spirit in obedience. How do you get this disciplined? You pray all the time. Sit back, relax. If you have a pen, I'm going to drain your ink. Listen to all the verses where Jesus prayed. Watch where he prayed. Watch how he started his ministry. Listen to how in every situation he prayed, he prayed, he prayed, he prayed, he prayed. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. The beginning of his ministry. Luke chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. By the way, the wilderness, hedras, is the same term, um, haremos, is the same term that he was drawn to when he was in his 40 days of fasting and temptations. He was prepping for the temptation. Matthew chapter 14, verse 23, sending everyone home, he went into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell, and he was there all alone. Mark chapter 6, verse 46, after telling everyone goodbye, he went up to the hills to pray all by himself. Luke chapter 9, verse 18, one day he left the crowds to go pray alone. Then you find out that through his life and ministry when he was around people, he prayed over everything, miracles and food. Listen, listen, you'd say, well, goodness, there are so many profound scriptures. Why tell us that he prayed over food so much? Matthew chapter 14, verse 9, he told the people to sit down on the grass. He took five loaves, two fish, looked up to heaven and prayed for it. Mark chapter 6, verse 41, he looked towards the heavens and blessed the food. Luke chapter 9, verse 16, he looked towards the heavens and blessed the food. John chapter 6, verse 1, then he took the loaves, gave thanks, and then distributed them. Mark, Matthew chapter 1, verse 36 He took the loaves and thanked God. This is the feeding of the 4,000 now. Mark chapter 8, verse 6, Jesus told the people to sit down and thanked him for them. Even in the Lord's Supper on Matthew chapter 26, verse 8, he thanked the Lord and blessed the food. He gave thanks. Listen, listen, I I wish I could grasp this. I'll say it again, but I just hope your mind grabs it. If you want to be spiritually strong in the cataclysmic seasons of your life, You will be strong if in the tranquil times of your life, you have this God consciousness just to pray and never stop praying. The more you pray to him over a meal and calm and you have a thankful heart and your heart communes with him all the time, when temptation comes, you will be strong because you are conditioned to commune. This is is not the time to start your spiritual strength conditioning. This is where you'll get your report card on how strong you've been. That's why he's thanking him for food. He's think, he's, 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 he gives, th- in, Mark, in Mark chapter 14, the father revealed that the, the Pharisees didn't get the truth and the Gentiles did. And so he just thanked God for his revealed will. He says that they were eating, he took some bread and he blessed it and he thanked them. Luke chapter 22, he thanked them for the wine and the food. And then he says, I thank you that, Father, that you have kept these things from the clever and revealed them to the child, like in Matthew, Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Whenever he saw the will of God being done, he just thanked him. He just prayed. He just, he just sparked up in prayer. When he got baptized, we often say the Father blessed him, the voice came from heaven, there's the Son of God, there's the Holy Spirit. But did you capture that little clause at the beginning of his baptism? Luke chapter 3, verse 21. One day when the crowds were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized, and as he was praying, the heavens opened. That whole scene was generated by the prayers of Jesus in that very special way. He just prayed every single time he could. When he was on the the Mount of Transfiguration that we just talked about, Remember that story where they were falling asleep? I don't know if you caught this word, but watch it. Luke chapter 9, verse 28 and 29. Eight days later, he took Peter, James, and John up to a mountain to pray. And before the Mount of Transfiguration happened where he was dazzling and transformed and the clothes were dazzling, it says this. As he was praying, then this all happened. Prayer precedes these miracles and this powerful event. He prayed for children. 
Oh, countless times. I love these passages. Matthew chapter 9, verse 19, verses 13 and 14. One day, some parents brought children to Jesus, hoping he could pray for them. The disciple says, get them away. And man, if, 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 if parents bring children and want Jesus to pray or have Jesus prayed over them, it's not good to go get these people away. And that's exactly what he did. And Jesus says, stop that. Let these children come to me. Don't stop that, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. And Mark chapter 10, verses 13 and 16 says that at that moment, quote, then he took the the children in his arms, placed them in his hands, and prayed over them, blessed them. Hebrews chapter 5, we don't go to this verse often in prayer. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. While Jesus was on this earth, quote, he offered prayers and pleadings with loud cries and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. Wow, that is startling. He prayed over big decisions. We often go to Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, where it says that um, Jesus divinely called his 12 disciples and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and every kind of illness and every kind of disease. The name of the 12 apostles are Peter, Andrew, James, John, Phil, Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew. Luke recounts that same decision, but here's what he said. Luke chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. One day soon after Jesus went to a mountain to pray, and he prayed all night, and the morning he called his disciples. This whole group Before he selected them, he went to a mountain to pray, and they were prayed over all night, all night long. And at daybreak, he called his disciples and chose all 12. Do you understand now in Matthew chapter 26, verse 40 and 41, when Jesus needed them to pray and they were going through temptation, and all that he has taught them about prayer couldn't? You watch and pray just for an hour? Have I spent three and a third years of my life not showing you that in the tough times, if you would have prayed in the tranquil, you would endure in the tough? This was, this was a season of frustration and disappointment. It's so unfortunate. The Lord prayed in the, on the cross, prayed in the garden, prayed all kinds of things. But I will tell you this, in all my searches, and there are more, and we're we're just, for the sake of uh, the situation, we're we're just going to withgo some, but I I, I wanted to let you know that there is one prayer that I am glad our dear Lord did not pray. You know, it says, whatever you ask of the Father, he'll give it to him if you're praying within his will. And Jesus always prayed within the will of God. And he always heard the response from from the Lord. But there's one prayer I'm so glad he didn't pray. And I don't know if you're like me, um, but this prayer is, is what made the gospel possible. In, um, in Matthew's gospel, chapter 27 and following, Jesus leaves this group right here, and he says, just take your sleep. I'm just going to go and pray. And then he turns to his, he prays on the, uh, on the ground. The... Um, about a year ago when we talked over Gethsemane, we talked about the pressuring. You, you know the words, the crushing, the stone. Gatshmanim is the word for, for olive press where he's experiencing all of these crushing blows. And um, um, just really a startling situation. He comes back and he says, um, wake up because they had fallen asleep again. Which is really interesting. They actually um, did not, um, in the Passover night, you were supposed to fast and pray all night. And you were not to break your fast till the next day. But they had this little tradition that once the first member of the group fell asleep, the party was over, literally. So that's why the Lord just said, okay, I'm, I'm alone. The party's over. He says, wake up, your accuser's coming. So here comes Judas with a band of, they suspect, over like 100 people. And 
he says, who do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I'm he. And they fell to the ground. We don't quite know what happened there, but the power of God. It go, I mean, I, I am was his response. I don't think Roman soldiers or temple guards really felt that they had to kneel in honor of that name. I think there was some level of unique power that just pushed them down. And he said, who do you see? Jesus of Nazareth, he goes, I am. And it fell to the ground again. And right there, Peter wakes up and sees the Lord verbally push people down. And so Peter gets this courage that we often dog him about. I mean, he was wrong to do it, but what makes a man grab his little Sakari sword and starts to take on over 100 guards and officers? I don't know, but he's probably thinking, hey, I, I, I don't like them, and I don't like them, you know, getting you, and if I get in trouble, just do that, like, verbal thing again. Just <laughs> do something. Just, just, if I get in trouble, and he... He attacks the people because he knows he's got this power source. He swings. Malchus is his name. He has reflexes. His ear cuts a, a portion of it. They bind Jesus. He calls Malchus over and says, um, and heals the man that's about to take him to his scourging. And Jesus says this while he's healing Malchus. Put that sword away. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. Now listen to this next phrase. Don't you know that I could call, I could pray right now for 12 legions of angels. 12 legions of angels. 11 disciples, Judas is out, maybe a legion for him, that's 6,000 angels. I could pray for 12 legions of angels right now to get me out of this situation. Oh, come on now. And then he shares why he's not going to pray that prayer. But how would it be that I don't fulfill the purpose? If I do that... I would not be able to fulfill the purpose for which I came. Oh, I'm glad he didn't pray that prayer. He's a praying man. His will will be done. But his will was to come to this earth to live a sinless life, to die a crucifixion, to be buried, to rise again, to offer salvation to whoever will call on the name of the Lord. For whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Praise be to God. He didn't pray that prayer. And what he calls on for you and me, because he didn't pray that prayer, to be in a constant state of prayer so that you'll know that powerful God is willing. And our flesh is so, so weak. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, never, Two. ever, One. ever Three. stop. Pray. Never stop. You tell mountains they must fall, and they fall. Mm. You tell oceans to. Tell sickness it must leave, then it's gone. In my weakness, God, I know you are strong. You are. You are the one above it all. I stand.
are bowed, we make this house a house of prayer. Whatever posture is most conducive for you to offer your prayers to the Lord, stand, sit, kneel. Doesn't matter what I do or anyone else. Ask the Lord, teach me to pray. Teach me to pray. Ask the Lord, Lord, May I pray to you all the time. Never stop praying. Ask the Lord, Lord, teach me. I, I, I want your spirit who is willing to show me, remind me, prompt my heart to pray in the quiet times, in the tranquil times, in the little ways, over food, on a hillside to pray, before making big decisions, all the time, Lord, may I never stop praying. May I pray without ceasing. May I have a God consciousness as I look at people, as I drive, as I have conversations, when I'm alone, 
in my music I listen to, the things I listen to that feed my mind with information. May I just have a prayerful spirit every walk of my day. And Lord, when the big things come, may I default to prayer. I ask for your spirit who is willing to help me. Make us people of prayer in the quiet times. Lord, thank you for this commitment of 90 days, but I pray that it invokes a wonderful desire to see how good it is to hear the Lord say, come talk with me, and my heart says, I'm coming. So may we have a heart of prayer. Teach us to pray in the quiet times. Make us strong in the challenging times. And Lord, may we see your glory as one of the only begotten Son of God. May we see your glory as we pray. May we see your glory. May we be changed. May we be different people because we breathe in and breathe out prayers. Lord, thank you, as Chad prayed earlier, that we can boldly come to your throne. Thank you. What a privilege, what a blessing. Lord, we will pray to you this week, even after we leave this place. We will continue to pray. We love you. We praise you. Thank you that we can pray to you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen, amen and amen. Well, God be praised. It is so good uh, to have you here. Um, um, I just want to share with you a couple things here. Um, let me just pull them up here real quick. Um, just want to encourage you that we are having um, BWE training, and by the way, we have secured our volunteers for that, but if you still want to join us, trust me, we will always take uh, helping hands that um, many hands makes the load uh, not that heavy. Uh, so we'll, we'll have a little training here. We're very excited to share with you uh, all that we're going to uh, look forward to. The kids are excited. We're so, so excited. I think we're all the biggest, biggest kids ever. And... Um, Still, if you want to work, just please, if you want to serve with us, it's, 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 it's an experience you won't forget and to be able to point those kids to Christ. Now, we're doing something very, very cool, very fun, and um, this, is, this is fun. Uh, the, uh, we are going to have, last year we had what we call, we affectionately call, these big nets we call hot dogs. So we had five hot dogs, these huge, huge nets, drops thousands of balloons. We're, we're having eight this year. And so we're almost doubling it. And we're going to have a balloon blowing up party. Now, if you right there go, my lungs can't handle it. Don't worry. Uh, we have an assembly line of, of um, ways we're going to do it. And they're actually going to get filled in just a few hours. Um, Saturday, June 3rd, from 10 to 3. And there's a little incentive if you come, actually. Of course, we'll feed you and all that. But uh, January, I'm sorry, January. June 3, uh, 10, 10 to, 10 to 3, I've, you'll put it up on social media. It'll be on social media. We'll send a text out. Um, we've got, we've got uh, the staff and a lot of people helping out, but we're going to feed you food, and we're going to blow. We have this down to a science, and eventually we'll actually line them up, all the hot dogs in the balcony. Uh, so for the next couple Sundays, they're, they're going to be obstructive. You will come down here. But... We are, everyone that comes, now imagine this chaos. Imagine, we're going to give you a gold Mylar balloon, you, and we want you to sign it. So Pastor Ben's balloon, you found Pastor Ben's balloon. I'm going to get one gold balloon, and I'm going to sign it. And if any kid finds it, and, and actually, I, th I thought of a crazy idea. I thought, let's, like, give a prize if anyone finds this balloon out of, like, thousands and uh, they said, every kid's going to be killing each other to find this gold balloon that is not healthy for the state of our church. So every worker that comes get a gold balloon, and we kind of subdued it. Uh, you, you say, found pastor's balloon, and we're going to ask the child, if you found the gold balloon, every worker will get one. If you come and help, you get to blow up one and then stuff it in one of the hot dogs. Um, they then get to post it on social media and say, hi, my name's Sarah. I found Pastor Ben's balloon. And on social media, we're going to tag everyone and send pictures and, and go, you found my balloon. And so um, every worker that comes is going to get a gold balloon, kind of like Willy Wonka's gold ticket, I guess. It's just we're going to put it in. And when they drop, 
whoever finds that balloon, we're going to ask their parents to post on social media and we'll tag each other. And then you can say, Pastor, I found Pastor Chad's balloon. Or I found, and, and we're all going to have a little good time on social media. So if you come, you'll get a gold balloon. You'll be able to write a message. And uh, you know those instances where they send, like, balloons out across the world. And you're like, call me if you find this. Well, we're going to do it right in here. So amid the chaos, if you come and help us blow up balloons, June 3rd, uh, on Saturday, we will uh, give you a gold balloon, and then you'll find out who, who found it. It'll be kind of cool. So um, we could use 30 to 50 people to make this go really fast. Uh, it really, if we had that amount of people, we have all these pumps, and um, it's, it's going to go really fast, and it'll be fun, believe it or not. And it'll actually all be done on June 3rd. Um, second, uh, let's see, let's see. We have summer pop-ups. The women's, uh, of course, is on June 9. That's fun. And you can sign up on the QR code there. The guys will also be uh, signing up for the golf thing. We got to know by May 30, so go ahead and sign up for that. And uh, that's going to be a fun thing too as well. Um, 90 days of prayer, I want to encourage you to continue that. That is one of our convictions, and I hope uh, today's treatment of the word will, will encourage you there as well. Um, we are prepping for Kids Communion next Sunday. Kids Communion is where we are going to have um, uh, preschool on down. We'll have child care, four years old on down. But then we will have all of the families here. And uh, actually, uh, Brandon Swain was sharing me the idea of, you know, my child accepts Christ. I don't know if we've ever done communion together. So this will be a time where we will share the gospel and we'll have the service uh, around that communion service. So please, please come. And it's going to be very special. I know many of you travel. Uh, having some younger families, I know you guys are obligated to go to others and commute over the holidays. We totally get it. But uh, we're going to have a great time of communion. And then um, in the summertime, boy, June hits. June is, we are just going active. We've got a lot of awesome things. The worship in this summer, usually churches kind of lighten up during the summer. We are ramping it up. We are going to have... My prayer has been just wonderful times of communion during the worship services. And um, so get ready for we don't know what will happen, but if we feel like praying in a moment or singing or doing something, we're just going to do it. And I, I hope we enter the fall in such a wonderfully spiritually revived uh, spirit. So the summer months are going to be wonderful times of worship, and I'm very, very excited for that. Uh, on behalf of the Grow family, if you're here as our guest, so glad that you're here. We have a gift for you. You can go to the Welcome Center. Uh, just tell them Pastor Ben. It's from all of us. The whole church sent you. And um, please accept that gift on, on our behalf. And if you would, just do a U-turn. Come right back around because we hang around and we'd love to meet you and make your acquaintance. But uh, on behalf of the Grow family, uh, thank you for coming. Hope you're encouraged and edified. And um, I love you and look forward to seeing you next week. We'll see you.